Second Peter chapter 3. He says, consider, verse 15, consider the long suffering of our Lord's salvation. As also our most dear brother Paul has written to you according to the wisdom that God gave him. He writes of these things in all his letters, speaking in them of these things, in which there are some things hard to understand, which the unlearned and the unstable twist, as they do the other uh, scriptures, to their own destruction. You, therefore, brethren, he says, knowing these things ahead of time, knowing that there is this danger, this possibility, take heed, lest being led astray by the error of the unwise, you fall from your own steadfastness. Take heed. Beware. Watch out. You can be led astray by people quoting, misquoting, sacred scripture. Instead, we should grow in grace, this is in verse 18, and grow in the knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, to whom be glory both now and forever and ever. Amen. What are some examples of some scriptures that I used to twist when I was a Protestant minister? I won't pick on anyone else, I'll simply point to myself. How did I misunderstand, perhaps in sincerity? Certainly in my case it was. I sincerely believed I was interpreting the Bible correctly when I would preach against Catholic doctrines. And when I would pluck people out of the Catholic Church and bring them into Protestantism, convinced that I was saving them from hell, that I was bringing them into real Bible-believing Christianity. I've entitled this first talk, The Dirty Dozen, to pick what I consider to be probably the 12 most frequently uh, quoted verses that are thrown at Catholics as a way of attempting to refute their doctrines. The dirty dozen untangling commonly twisted Bible quotes. The twisting comes from St. Peter's words. They're not, it's not mine. He says people twist scripture. I'm going to give you the 12 examples that I encounter most frequently in my life. But we're going to have a time of questions and answers as well. And if there are verses which I didn't cover that you have thrown at you, that's your chance to add to this baker's dozen. Now, we're going to take a break after that, and uh, but we're going to stay on time. We've started late. We started uh, a little over half an hour late, but uh, we can make up the time. We don't need a 45-minute break, at least I don't, between these two talks. So we'll make up the time because I don't want people going, going home late this evening. Um, the second talk after the break this evening will be just the opposite. That's entitled 12 and True, One Dozen Bible Verses Every Catholic Should Know. These are 12 verses that you should know, you should memorize, or at least you should know where to find them in Scripture. These are verses, every single one of the 12, that pose a problem for Protestantism. They don't compute. They don't factor into the evangelical equation. But here, first, we're looking at 12 verses that Protestants think condemn Catholicism. I've broken them up, I've divided them up according to the topics that Protestants most likely feel are the Achilles heels of Roman Catholicism, the areas of weakness in our doctrine. The first one that I want to take us to has to do with the Protestant conviction that the Bible teaches salvation by faith alone. Salvation by faith alone without need for sacraments, without the need for doing any good works at all, without the need to obey the commandments of God. One of these verses that they will quote in favor of this, probably the one most generally quoted, is found in St. Paul's letter to the Romans. So turn to that, please. Four Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, Acts, Romans. Romans chapter 3, verse 28. Certainly. Sure. <laughs> Romans chapter 3, verse 28. This doctrine, as you're turning to find the passage, this doctrine that we're justified, that we're put right with God by faith alone, is one of the two pillars of Protestantism. In fact, Luther said it was the essential doctrine. He said he could forgive Rome any other heresy or, or abomination, as he put it, when he characterized Roman Catholic doctrine. Except for this one. This is the one fatal flaw. In fact, one of the great Reformed theologians, the great Calvinist theologians of the world, uh, Dr. John Gerstner, said that if 
the Catholic Church were right on this doctrine, he would be back on his knees at the Vatican tomorrow begging readmittance. He said anything else pretty much could be swallowed, but this doctrine strikes at the very heart of the issue between Protestantism and Catholicism. He is willing to sort of bank everything, to put all his money on this one issue, that the Bible teaches justification by faith alone. And here's the proof text. Romans 3.28 We reckon that a man is justified by faith apart from the works of the law. A man is justified by faith apart from the works of the law. Has anyone ever quoted that verse to you? Ever heard it? They said, look, why do you say you have to be baptized? Why do you say that you have to keep the Ten Commandments? We're justified by faith apart from such works. Now, there are other verses which say nearly the same thing. One of them would be Galatians, for example, uh, chapter 2, verse 16. Don't turn to it. Uh, we're just going to use this one to represent this doctrine. But just jot down in your notes that, that they may not use this one. They may use Galatians 2, 16. It says virtually the same thing. Galatians 2, 16 says, But we know that a man is not justified by the works of the law, but by faith in Jesus Christ. And we also believe, therefore, in Jesus Christ, that we may be justified by the, by the faith of Christ and not by the works of the law, because by the works of the law, no flesh shall be justified in his sight. That's a fuller one. Maybe I should have quoted that one instead. Either way, Romans 3.28, Galatians 2.16. Those are the two verses that Martin Luther used again and again to hammer away at what he considered the heresy of the Roman Catholic Church's teaching that justification is not by faith alone. Now... I'm not here to prove to you in this talk, and by the way, we only have five minutes roughly on each of these doctrines. You can figure it out for yourself. We've, we can do the math. We've got 12 verses to cover. We've only, we only want to spend about an hour speaking, so it's going to have to be uh, about five minutes a verse, give or take, on an average. I'm not going to quote to you verses that prove that justification by faith alone is a heresy. I'll do that in the next talk. I'll give you verses that refute Protestant ideas. I'm simply going to show that this verse doesn't refute Catholicism, okay? Why doesn't it? Well, the arrow misses its target. What Paul is shooting at, what Paul is condemning our confidence in, is works of the law. But what does works of the law mean? Does it mean baptism? Does it mean obedience to the moral law of God? Do we don't have to keep the Ten Commandments anymore? No, it doesn't mean that at all. What does the works of the law mean? Even a Protestant like Joseph B. Tyson, who's written an article on this in the uh, Journal of Biblical Literature called Works of the Law in Galatians, and it applies to Romans as well. He points out that the phrase, the works of the law, ta erga tu namu, it is in Greek, the works of the law, is a technical term in discussions among the rabbis in the first century that refers to Old Testament, or, or Mosaic, I should say, ceremonial observances, like circumcision and keeping the kosher laws. If you look at this text in its context, context means that which must come with a text, because a text without a context can be a pretext for all kinds of errors. If you look at this verse in its context, what is it that Paul is arguing against in the letter to the Romans? Who are his enemies? Are they prototypes of Catholics who are saying you have to be baptized? Is that who Paul's upset about? Is it people running around saying you have to obey the Ten Commandments? Does Paul anywhere refute or debate such a point of view in this letter or in Galatians? Absolutely not. Who were the people that he was upset about? Who were the people that he was arguing against? The Judaizers. That is very clear if you read the passage. It's very clear in Galatians. The whole letter of Galatians is meant to condemn some people that were running around and saying to Gentiles, you have to be circumcised to be a Christian. These Jews had become Christians, or they purported to have become Christians. Paul seems to cast doubt on the sincerity of their conversion. He says they are enemies of the cross of Christ. He refers to them as dogs, as mutilators of the flesh. He says that if they do not repent of this teaching of theirs, they will be damned. He says they're preaching another gospel. And whoever preaches another gospel, he says, let him be anathema. In Galatians chapter 1, verse 8 and verse 9. What was this other gospel? That Gentiles had to become Jews. That they had to be circumcised. That they had to eat the kosher laws. 
These were the works of the flesh. 